these talks by a somewhat provocative uh, slide. I hope it's not too provocative for here. Uh, I, this isn't meant to build this wall. This is actually meant to break the wall down. And the statement that I'd like to start with is since it was used for the first time in the 1940s, hydraulic fracturing of natural gas wells has never been proven to contaminate drinking water. And then I ask the question, is this true or does it matter? Okay, that's probably enough to get anybody upset, no matter what side of the wall you're on. Um, but what I mean by this, well, is that what are we talking about here? What does is proven mean? What is the nature of proof? And what are we talking about when we say hydraulic fracturing? I think a lot of times when you hear this statement mentioned, People are talking about just the process of fracturing the rock. That's the people up on this side of the wall. People on this side of the wall are talking about the entire process. Okay. We don't have that many examples, maybe three that I can think of, where we have really good evidence that hydraulic fracturing itself, just, just fracturing the rock, breaking it up and releasing up by the hydraulic fracture fluid has contaminated drinking water. I can only think of three cases where it's been pretty well shown. But there's a lot of pretty good evidence that the whole process can have impacts on our on our drinking water perhaps and our health. And so when I say does this matter, I say I'm referring to hydraulic fracture. Does it really matter? say that the process of breaking the rock has to contaminate the drinking water? Probably not. What we really want to look at is the entire process. And the entire process, I'm talking about drilling. This is where, you know, by definition, the aquifer is contacted by drilling. The hydraulic fracture process itself, trucking. Um, of course, I have to admit that I took this picture while driving. Impoundments, mountain safe tanks, and pipelines. And most importantly, the one thing that we have to remember is that wells are there virtually forever. And we have to know about what happens to them, not five years from now, not ten years from now, but a hundred years from now. And at least one of the cases that I know of where there's good evidence that the fracturing process contaminated the aquifer because of the existence of an unknown uh, land as well. So we need to consider all these aspects when we're considering uh, the effects of human and animal health. And so what our study really does here, it, well, the way we look at it is from the point of view of biomedical research. Now we're not so, you know, our background really is in, in environmental sciences, it's in, it's, in, it's in biomedical research. And when you think about how does we go about studying a problem, or say a disease out there, uh, what comes to mind generally to me is like the AIDS epidemic. How was that studied at first? Well, the CDC identified cases, individual cases, of gay men with carposis Sarcoma in San Francisco and published case reports. We went on to epidemiological studies. Finally, the virus was identified. Drug targets were identified. Drugs were developed. And a lot of progress has been made. But it started with case studies. And that's really where I think we are now, at least our work, is seeing where exposures might occur, what things could occur based on case studies, what we're very interested in doing is moving on and learning more about epidemiology. You know, where, where are the, you know, what is the prevalence of the problems that we see? And um, exactly what parts of the drilling process might cause them or might not cause them. Okay. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to let Michelle talk about um, our study, so we generally do, she does all the interesting stuff. She's going to talk about the, the 
the animals. And at the end, I'm going to come back and talk a little bit more about policy relative to what we've learned. So we'll let Michelle take over now. Okay, so. 
present, and from that we can identify recent exposure and concrete reported problems. Okay, so in the center, um, you can see the animals. Uh, I mentioned some of these different kinds of animals that we are uh, documenting. You can see uh, I've chosen the governor to stay here in the middle. <laughs> um, on the outside, you can see the potential sources of exposure and the different phases of, of the uh, industrial process. Um, and I'll run through each one of those uh, in just a minute. I just want to say uh, something about the whole slide here. Uh, first of all, our cases, um, some of them have more than one uh, group of exposure. Uh, so that's important. The second thing is that a good number of the cases, uh, approximately three quarters of them, uh, have reported that the well water quality and or quantity change following drilling and or hydraulic fracturing. Okay, and then we thought one third have told us uh, or reported or we've seen on the timeline where the exposure was wastewater uh, and another third have reported um, air quality changes. Uh, a lot of that involved here, but some of that involved here and here as well. Okay, so let's run through these. We just mentioned um, well water quality, quantity changes, um, the drilling fluids, uh, drilling uh, buds or fluids, whatever you want to call it. Um, pits are usually lined, they can leak, or they can spill. Um, the drilling fluids can overrun the well pad during the blowout. Uh, with the storms, uh, there can be runoff from the well pad. Uh, this is a really frequent one. People will tell me, uh, especially people with livestock, um, that their animals will be grazing just below well pads, uh, and there's oftentimes runoff from storms, and their and their animals are exposed. Uh, flaring and venting. Uh, the difference here is that the yeah, gas is being released to the to the burn, uh, as it can be released to the burn on. And this can be again intentional or unintentional. Okay, so with hydraulic fracturing, again the same thing with the uh, uh, water quality and quantity change. Um, fracturing will be released from folding tanks. We'll be talking about a release of that.
compressor stations can now function, uh, making very, very loud noise and also skewing uh, what we've heard is some sort of oil into the air. Pipelines can heat um, condensing tanks and then they're venting and they're causing spills. And I just want to make one comment uh, that these are our uh, sources of exposure for the cases that we, potential sources of exposure for the cases that we have. There are other sources of exposure we read in these meeting recently in Washington. What was brought out there, it's very important for everyone to hear, is that the frack sand that's used, the, the sand that's used for fracking, uh, has to be mined. And uh, oftentimes now, what we're hearing is for the people, the workers, especially for the workers, but also for the communities that live around these, um, these frack sand um, mining places, uh, are becoming, uh, having, having these uh, silica uh, dust in their lungs and developing silicosis. So that,